the, uh, the exciting keynote speaker. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Jez. Um, you know, many of you know he's uh, CTO of DevOps Research. He's uh, one of the major thought leaders in the DevOps movement. Uh, he's written several books, including uh, uh, Continuous Delivery, uh, his newest book, Accelerate, and of course, the DevOps Handbook. But uh, he's also a, a, a professor at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, here's Jez Humble. Thank you, sir. Yes. Good to Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, good to see you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to take a minute to get set up here, and I'll be right with you. Okay, well, while we're waiting, one thing... Hey, cool. Great. Thanks very much. All right. So, what I was going to tell you before I got my slides, thank you very much at the back. Uh, I know that I give you heartburn every time that I present from the front, so thanks very much for putting up with me. Um, yesterday was launch day for the 2018 State of DevOps report, so uh, that has been keeping uh, Nicole and I and Jean busy for the last few months. So, uh, you can get it at this URL, or you can use your mobile uh, mainframe to take a picture of this and uh, get your own copy. Lots of cool stuff there. I'm going to present some of it today. This is the first talk I'm giving um, about uh, the State of DevOps Report 2018, so this is brand new goodness. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we do this work because um, it's actually a really big deal to do science in the context of software development, um, which is something I'll, I'll talk about later. And obviously, uh, engineers are not at all a suspicious bunch. You know, they're not skeptical or cynical about things at all, and they just believe whatever you tell them. Um, so I've had no trouble at all uh, telling people about these results and them going, well, yes, obviously that's true. So briefly, going to talk a little bit about. Uh, what kind of goes on behind the curtain when we put together the State of DevOps report and what we mean when we say we're doing science. And then I'm going to talk um, for most of the time about what we found and what was uh, unexpected about that and, and, and the cool stuff and the good stuff. Um, two main areas that I'm going to cover, some technical stuff and some management stuff. So uh, she can't be here with us today, but uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, the lead investigator on uh, this State of DevOps report uh, and the State of DevOps reports for the last four years before this year. Also, the uh, lead author on Accelerate, the latest book that she and I have released, which covers the last four years, but not this year. Um, so this is Nicole. I'll do my best to, to channel her. Uh, sorry in advance, Nicole. Um, so let's talk a bit about data. So obviously, we do computers. Computers aren't very useful without data, so we're all familiar with data. Um, so I'm going to turn around at this point. Put your hands up if you think that surveys suck. OK, not looking. Not looking. All right. Who loves the data from their log files? Come on. OK, who here is from IT ops? Who have we got here from operations infrastructure? DBAs, you can put your hands up too. Um, all right, who, who here writes software, like writes code? Uh, it's more dev than ops, I don't know, I think. Uh, all right, who here, is, who here is a managerial type or people uh, type person? OK, that's, that's pretty good. So this is, the, this is the thing that gets left out of dev and ops, is that like, you have to manage stuff. Um, so uh, managers are, are quite maligned. Let's have a big round of applause for the managers. Come on. <laughs> Honestly, I say this because I was a manager, and it was the most stressful job I ever had. And now people are like, well, we need a manager. And I'm like, no way. I don't want people reporting to me. That's the worst job in the world. It's so hard. So you know, all problems ultimately come back to people problems. If you're in charge of the people problems, that's incredibly hard. So you know, I know everyone likes to be mean to managers, but uh, it's actually a really uh, rough job. So you love the data from your log files, some of you. Um, who has seen like terrible data from their log files? Where they're like, There's more people than like the data from their log files. All right, so we know data can be problematic, right? Um, and, and this is true of surveys as much as it's true of the data in your log files. So when we're measuring this stuff that goes into the state of DevOps report, there's an important concept, which is this idea of a latent construct. What's a latent construct? Well, 
If you want to measure something like temperature, you can get a thermometer, right? So we have devices to measure physical variables about the world. But when we're doing surveys, what we're measuring is not physical stuff. We're measuring what's going on in your mind, your beliefs, your attitudes, those kinds of things. And so this is what latent constructs come from. Uh, it comes from the field of psychometrics. In psychometrics, what we're doing is we're measuring those things, beliefs and attitudes. And, you know, I used to study physics. My undergraduate degree is in physics. People think that uh, psychometrics is kind of like a, a crappy version of science because it's not measuring real things. Um, but <laughs> let me tell you, beliefs and attitudes are absolutely real. Uh, and in physics, I spent quite a long time looking at quantum mechanics. And uh, there's a lot of very interesting questions about the extent to which physical measurements actually measure things that are real in the universe and what that might mean. So different problems. But no better or worse than the other problems we have in science where we're trying to measure things that um, are hard to measure. So when we're measuring things about people's beliefs and attitudes, we have to do a bunch of work to make sure that those, uh, those measurements are good. First of all, when we're writing the questions that we ask people, we use previously validated constructs. So we use theories that people have already tested. We use questions that people have already tested that are known to work. Uh, and we carefully and precisely word those questions. And we use a bunch of techniques to make sure that those questions mean what we think they mean and not something else. And then when we get the data back, we actually analyze the data to make sure that those constructs are valid and reliable, that they consistently measure the things they're supposed to measure and not something else. So let's have an example. We wanted to measure culture. Everyone knows culture is important in DevOps, right? So what do, we mean by, what do we mean by culture? Well, there's a whole bunch of theories about culture. People have looked at uh, national identity. People have looked at um, adaptive culture. There's whole studies of learning culture. Um, the study we ended up using and the theory we ended up using was from a guy called Ron Westrom. And I'll talk about this um, in, in just a minute. So first of all, we selected a theory. This is a theory we're going to use to base our research on. Now, Westrom was a sociologist studying safety outcomes in healthcare and aviation. So these are fields where when things go wrong, people die. So safety is really important. And he found that a good way for thinking about safety was to think about information flow in your organization. So how does information flow through your organization? And he created a typology. And in the typology, there's three columns. Firstly, pathological or power-oriented cultures, second, bureaucratic or rule-oriented cultures, and finally, generative or performance-oriented cultures, also known as mission-oriented cultures. So six axes here. Firstly, the extent to which people cooperate with each other. Secondly, how do we deal with people who bring us bad news? Do we shoot people who bring us bad news? Do we ignore people who bring us bad news? Or do we train and encourage people to bring us bad news so that we can act on it as soon as possible before small problems turn into big problems and turn into catastrophic problems? Fourth, how do we deal with bridging between different departments and different parts of the organization? I, I go and talk to companies a fair amount. And I've gone to talk to companies. There's been a big audience. And I say, so infrastructure people, put your hands up. No hands go up. And I'm like, hmm. I think I'm starting to see what the problem might be here. And I say, well, can we have some of the infrastructure people here? And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. Um, and so that, that's a real problem. And often, if you actually go and talk to those people, people always say, you know, I'm like, why can't you do this stuff? And they say, it's the auditors. And, people, and I, I say, well, have you spoken to the auditors? And they're like, don't be ridiculous. And I actually I went and spoke at a large bank last year. And I was kind of doing, going and talking to the executive people. And, and this, this woman came up to me and said, I'm so glad to hear you talk about controls. No one ever talks about controls. And I said, well, what, what's your role? And she said, well, I, I, I'm in charge of auditing. Uh, and I'm really into this whole continuous delivery thing. I think it's really great. Uh, and <laughs> I'd just spoken to a developer earlier who's like, the auditors won't let us do this. And it, I was going to say, well, I said to the developer, your challenge is to go and take the auditor, someone from the auditing team out for lunch. Uh, and that's my number one DevOps hack. All those people in your organization who you're like, these people are the reason we can't do this, go and take one of them out for lunch, buy them lunch, sit and listen to them quietly, 
as, and ask them why they hate you so much and, and why their life is so miserable and, and, and listen quietly to the answer uh, and then think about what you could do to make their life a bit less horrible. Um, that's a really powerful DevOps hack. It's my, my biggest top tip. Um, go and find those people, take them out for lunch. It, it, it's, in, it's incredibly uh, powerful and it really works. So two things that are really connected to each other. How do we deal with failure and how do we deal with novelty? So, if failure leads to scapegoating, if it leads to people being punished or fired, that's a problem. What we're all doing in technology and product development is innovating. And what that means is we're doing things that have not been done before. If you're doing something that hasn't been done before, the chances of that thing failing are quite high, or at least non-zero. If you know you're going to be punished if something goes wrong, how likely are you to try something with a non-zero risk of failure? It's a problem. So, how we deal with failure is important. Failure should not, certainly not lead to blame. And justice is problematic as well, because what failure should really lead to is inquiry. How can we make sure this problem doesn't happen again? And that doesn't mean, you know, it was Mark's fault, let's get rid of Mark. It means, why did Mark make the decisions that he made? How can we get Mark better information and better tools? How can we improve our system so that the individuals within that system can make better decisions? And once you address that problem, you'll find a better attitude to novelty as well. In pathological organizations, novelty is crushed. In bureaucratic organizations, novelty leads to problems like scope creep. And then in mission, oriented organizations, novelty is implemented. So those two things are two sides of the same coin. How do we deal with failure? How do we deal with novelty? So we want to measure culture. How do we do that? Well, what we do is we take this typology and we turn it into questions. Questions that have st strong statements with clear language. So you could think about this for a while. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip right to the answer. These are the questions that, that we asked. Um, we actually asked one more this year as well. Um, so we ask those questions, and we ask you to strongly agree or strongly disagree or in between. So for each of these questions, we get a number back from one to seven, where one is strongly disagree all the way through to seven, which is strongly agree. Uh, and yesterday in the leadership workshop, I actually got people to answer these questions on a scale from one to seven, and then you take the average, and then you have a number for culture. So even though culture seems intangible, uh, actually, there's a pretty straightforward way to get a number that measures your culture. Uh, and that's not an objective measure of your culture. It's a measure of your experience of the culture. So an interesting thing you can do, which I have done, in fact, in the past, uh, companies I've worked at, is you go and ask that from everyone, and you see what's different between different groups. Do the managers have the same experience of culture as the people doing the work? Do people in different parts of the organization, like dev or ops or uh, DBAs or testers, have different experiences of the culture? Do people from um, protected classes have different experiences of the culture? Uh, women versus men, people from different races, people with disabilities. These are interesting questions that you can ask about the culture of your organization. Uh, and being able to quantify it allows you to actually do interesting analysis. It doesn't tell you everything, by all means, but it gives you a really good starting point to start asking useful and important questions. So, another example of applying psychometrics. We wanted to know about the impact of failure notification. How do we know when things go wrong? So we came up with a bunch of questions. And these are the questions we came up with in 2014 to find out about, uh, you know, to try and study how uh, being notified of failure impacts performance. We found a surprise. So I'm not going to ask you to guess, because it's early in the morning. I don't know how much the, the coffee has kicked in yet. But what we found is we were actually measuring two different things here. And again, the statistical analysis told us that. It told us this is not one thing. This is actually two things. It doesn't tell you why. This is the thing with data. Data tells you what's happening. It doesn't tell you why it's happening. For that, you need to actually go and talk to real people and use empathy and stuff like that. But it tells you that something is happening. So it told us there was two different things here. And what we realized is that these first two questions, and the stats said these two questions are one thing, and these, two, and these three questions are another thing. And what we realized is that this is notification from outside your team 
And this is notification from inside your team. So actually measuring two different things. So that's an example of what the analysis that we do when we get the data back tells us. It can tell us, no, you're measuring different things, or these things aren't correlated, or um, these questions aren't really very meaningful. So we do a whole bunch of data tests off the back of the data we get back. Um, this is all stats bingo. Um, if you, I don't have uh, good explanations of these things, you'd have to talk to Nicole about that. But Nicole basically sits in front of a hot computer doing all kinds of advanced statistical tests to validate the data and make sure that we're not, uh, our data isn't biased in various different ways. So I said earlier we're doing science. Obviously, uh, science is one of these words that gets thrown around a lot. Um, there's actually three ways that you can do scientific studies. One is randomized experimental design, randomized controlled experiments. That's how we do science in medicine when we're, giving, uh, when we're testing drugs and stuff like that. We can't do that in software because there are too many variables. Trying to compare teams, which is what you'd need to do, you'd need to take a control team and then another team. There are so many variables, and those variables uh, interact in nonlinear ways. Uh, I once worked on a, 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 with a guy who, who tried to do a study like this, and he, he was comparing the difference between the performance of a team. Uh, and the performance was very different, and he couldn't work out why. And then he realized the team had been moved into uh, a basement which didn't have any natural light. Uh, and when he talked to people, they were really unhappy about this, and it was making them significantly less productive. So it's really difficult to look at the performance of teams and compare them just because there's so many variables. So it's very hard to do that in the context of software delivery. Also, companies aren't very keen on spending double the amount of money on people so that they can have a control group. That's not very popular for your CFOs. Um, secondly, longitudinal. So when you actually look at people over time or teams over time and how their behavior changes over time. So that's hard and it's very expensive and we didn't do that. What we do instead is theory-based design, which means we have a proven theoretical model. We develop hypotheses based on that model. We test the hypotheses. We get back the data. Um, and that the data tells us whether our, our hypothesis was true or false. So, you know, classic scientific methods, that's what we're doing. So, that's the science. Now I'm going to talk about the results. One of the earliest things we found with the state of DevOps data is that software delivery matters. We've been told for a long time in uh, sources like Harvard Business Review that IT doesn't matter, that IT can't provide a competitive advantage. It's just like plumbing. Everyone else can buy it too, so it's not going to create a sustainable competitive advantage. So if the rise of uh, the FANGs and their counterparts in, in other countries uh, hasn't made people realize that perhaps there might be a flaw in that argument, uh, our data confirms that that's actually not true. What we find is that firms with high-performing software development and delivery capabilities are twice as likely to exceed their profitability, market share, and productivity goals. Uh, that was what we found in 2014. We've replicated that finding, not always with the same numbers, but it's always been there and statistically um, meaningful. So we know that software delivery matters and it has an impact on those commercial outcomes that we care about. Last year and this year, we also looked at non-commercial outcomes, things like quality of products or services, operating efficiency, customer satisfaction, achieving organization and mission goals. So who here works in government or in nonprofits? Academia? OK, a few of you. So this matters in those contexts as well. I worked for the US federal government in 2016. Um, and we cared about this stuff because it was important in terms of our mission of being able to serve the American people. So it matters in nonprofit contexts as well as commercial contexts. What do we mean by software delivery performance? Well, we found four ways of measuring software delivery performance that have shown to be valid and reliable over the last five years that we've been, been doing the study. There's two measures of performance here, of, of, sorry, of throughput, of speed. How fast are we going? Firstly, lead time for changes. So that's how long does it take to go from version control to production? Second is deploy frequency. How frequently can we deploy to prod or a prod-like environment? And then to stability metrics. When there's an incident, how long does it take us to restore service, whether that's a rollback or an emergency fix? And then change fail rate, which is a measure of the quality of our release process. When we push a change out to production, what percentage of the time do we have to, to make that uh, emergency fix? 
If you take one thing away from this talk, it's this. High performers do better at both. We're really used to thinking about speed and stability as a trade-off. That's not true. High performers do better at both speed and stability, and the capabilities that enable speed done right also enable high quality. This is one of the lessons of the lean movement in manufacturing. Uh, what that movement taught us is that you can pursue multiple goals, quality, cost, speed, and get better at all of them. We're not actually operating in a trade-off environment. So engineers are used to working with trade-offs, but it's also important to know when you don't actually have to accept a trade-off and when you can fundamentally change the game. Our data from this year, and again, this is brand new, uh, it's, it's really interesting. We actually have a, a larger proportion of our respondents are in the high-performing group this year, which means they're delivering between once an hour and once a day. Uh, sorry, that's the frequency between once an hour and once a day. Their, their lead time for changes is between a day and a week. Time to restore service, less than a day. And their change failure rate is 0 to 15%. So this is actually 48% um, of our respondents. That's nearly half of our respondents. So that's bigger than previous years. And what that shows us is that we're getting better as an industry. What we also found is that everyone can achieve this. There's no significant statistical differences between different domains or between different organization sizes. So we found large organizations in the high-performing group. We found small organizations in the low-performing group. We found regulated domains like healthcare and financial services in the high-performing group. Anybody can do this. Just requires sustained, ongoing effort and, and work to do the things that help you get here. We also found that 7% of our respondents were in this elite group here. So this elite group are doing on-demand deployments multiple times per day. They can get changes or emergency fixes into production in less than an hour. Um, who here has a different process for emergency changes than they have for normal changes? OK, what don't you do in your emergency process that you do in your normal process? Approvals. What else? Yeah. Testing. How good an idea is it when you have a problem in production to push out a change that you haven't tested fully? Might not be a great idea. Um, so the goal here is to be able to use your normal process for making emergency changes. And that's what we see in the elite performers. Their normal process is so efficient that they can use that for making emergency changes as well. And they have a, a low change fail rate. So. These are the proportions of the various groups. Uh, and it's not that high performers are getting worse. We're seeing that high performers are maintaining the same high levels of performance, but there's, there's more of them. And as I say, they're achieving both goals. This year, we also extended our model to look at availability. Availability means that your service, your product or service can be accessed by its users and that you can make promises about the availability of your service um, so these are service le level objectives. What we see is that, again, if you're doing well in software delivery, you also do well with availability. Elite performers are 3.5 times more likely to have strong availability practices. So again, these things go together. It's not that people are trading off speed versus availability. People who do well do well at speed and stability and availability as well. In previous years, we've looked at how you achieve high performance. So you, you know where you are in, on, on this table of, uh, that I showed you of elite all the way through to low. The question is, how do you move from low to high? So this is the question that we've been asking in our research. There's a very big diagram at the back of our book, Accelerate. Um, so uh, I, you know, if you can just memorize that quickly, there'll be a test at the end. Um, there's three main sets of capabilities that predict high performance. Firstly, product development capabilities. Secondly, management capabilities. And thirdly, the technical capabilities. And I'm going to go into more detail later. So you know, if you can't read this from the back, don't worry. They'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go into some detail. The key thing to bear in mind here is that all of these groups of capabilities, um, the product development, the management, and the technical ones, they all predict software delivery performance. So it's more than correlation. We use a statistical model that allows us to talk about prediction or impact. So we know that these things impact software delivery performance. That's why the arrows point in one direction. 
Um, they also impact culture. So how do you change culture? Well, implementing these capabilities changes the culture. So actually investing in these capabilities will change your culture, and culture impacts performance, both software delivery performance and organizational performance as well. Implementing these capabilities also reduces burnout on your teams, and the technical practices in particular lead to lower levels of rework, which means high levels of quality, because we're building quality in rather than having to fix problems downstream when we find them downstream. So I'm going to zoom in on these three groups. Firstly, the technical practices. So all these things together, we say, predict continuous delivery. Continuous delivery means that your software is always deployable throughout the, the life cycle of the system. Uh, my, my number one test for continuous delivery, who in this room is doing releases at evenings and weekends? Who has to work evenings and weekends to do releases? OK, that's about a third of you. So that's a sign that something's wrong. Uh, I want to be really clear about that. Um, the reason that me and Dave Farley wrote the continuous delivery book is that we didn't want to work evenings and weekends anymore, uh, basically. Um, and we work with a bunch of other people who found ways to, to solve these problems that cause us to work evenings and weekends, so we didn't have to. And the first project I worked on where we employed these techniques at significant scale, which was back in 2005, that was the outcome. The first release we did, we had a big Gantt chart. We were all in at the weekend um, in London, where I was working at the time, doing the release. And then subsequently to that, all releases happened during normal business hours. We actually, um, I mean, we didn't have Terraform and Chef and Puppet and all these tools that we have today, uh, you know, Kubernetes, none of that stuff existed. Um, we actually wrote all our automation in Ant, and then we went and asked the infrastructure people, you know, what do you think of these Ant files? And they basically told us where, they, where we could stick our Ant files. Um, and, <laughs> and we said, well, what, what language do you like? What language do you want us to use? And they said, well, we, we use Bash. So we said, OK, we'll build you a deployment system in Bash, which we did. It was called Conan the Deployer. And he would start up Conan, and he would tell it the tag in CVS to build from, and he would tell it the environment to deploy to. Uh, and it took about an hour to check out the binaries of things like web logic out from CVS, and then check out the configuration and apply it and build the walls and the ears and deploy them and all this kind of thing. But when we're done with that, you could run that during your lunch break, come back, and then do a, a sub-second cutover and a sub-second rollback to the backup environment in less than a second, and that meant we could do deployments during normal business hours. So this was using 2005 technology. This was all Java and WebLogic and Bash and CVS. Um, so tools are great. I love tools. But tools are neither necessary nor sufficient for achieving these outcomes. You have to do the work, which means doing the deployment automation work, continuous integration, developing off trunk, building a loosely coupled architecture, using version control for everything, including your database schema scripts and your infrastructure configuration. And then some stuff we tested this year, continuous testing, monitoring and observability, those database practices I talked about, and shifting left on security. So that was some new stuff this year. The other thing we looked at this year was cloud infrastructure and the impact of using cloud infrastructure. So who here is running stuff in the cloud? OK, probably <laughs> the same amount of you who are doing deployments at evenings and weekends, which is <laughs> a bit scary. Um, so I see in companies, lots of companies moving to the cloud. So they spend a lot of money doing a cloud implementation. And then they put ServiceNow in front of it. So that if, as a developer, you want a server, you still have to raise a ticket in ServiceNow. And it still takes a week for someone in the IT ops team to go to the console in Amazon and start up a server and then give you the credentials to log into that server and close your ticket on ServiceNow. So TLDR, that's not a cloud. Um, and the reason I know this, uh, who has a friend who's in this situation? <laughs> so I know that Texas, historically, uh, and in popular culture, has an aversion to, uh, to federal government. 
But it turns out that the National Institute of Science and Technology actually has a really nice guide to um, what it, a definition of, of cloud services. So again, I used to work in the federal government. Um, this is what uh, NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology, says about clouds and, and what cloud means. To say you're doing clouds, and you can go and download NIST, NIST special publication 800-145, which it, I think has to be the shortest one. When I was working in the government, you had to implement um, 325 information security controls to take a government information system live. There was a 400 plus page book that detailed all those information security controls, and then another 400 plus page book which detailed how you documented the implementation of those security controls. Um, this is like five pages. It's extremely light reading by government standards. Uh, so they detail five criteria for saying you're doing cloud. Number one, on-demand self-service, which means that as a consumer, you have to be able to unilaterally provision cloud resources without human intervention. So again, if you have to raise a ticket on service now, that's not on-demand self-service. I mean, by service now standards, it's on-demand self-service, but it's not real on-demand self-service. Uh, broad network access, which means you have to be able to access it on all your devices. There has to be resource pooling, so there has to be you know, time sharing or some other way of having virtual abstractions where physical resources are shared between different users. There has to be rapid elasticity, which means that you, you have to have the appearance of infinite resources. And there has to be a measured service, which means you have to get a bill, broadly speaking. So if you can't answer yes to all these questions, it's not a real cloud. And what we found is that only 22% of teams that said they were using the cloud actually met these definitional characteristics of using a cloud. However, teams that could say yes to this were 23 times more likely to be in the elite performing group, which is huge. So using the cloud, yay. Lifting and shifting your stuff into the cloud without changing it and then put a putting a service now in front of it, not so much. I want to talk a bit about architectural outcomes. So again, big fan of tools. Um, who's using Docker or Kubernetes in, in production? In production. OK, a bunch of you. So like, I love these tools. They're great. They're really powerful. What we found, uh, and this is last year's results, is that actually what's most important is the outcomes. So. When we measured this in 2017, in the group of survey respondents, the biggest predictor of the ability to do continuous delivery was whether they could answer yes to these questions. Can my team make large-scale changes to the design of its system without the permission of someone outside the team or depending on other teams? Can my team complete its work without needing fine-grained communication and coordination with people outside the team? Can my team deploy and release its product or service on demand independently of other services the product or service depends upon? Can my team do most of its testing on demand without requiring an integrated test environment? And then the last one, the continuous delivery outcome. Can my team perform deployments during normal business hours with negligible downtime? Now, you can be using mainframes and say yes to all these questions. And I've, worked, I've, I've seen teams who've actually done all this stuff with mainframes. Equally, you could have the latest shiny microservices architecture running on Kubernetes and not be able to answer yes to these questions, in which case you wasted all your money, sorry. Because it's the outcomes that are important, not the technology. So if you're doing a technology transformation and you're adopting all these new technologies, please pay attention to the outcomes, because it's the outcomes of doing that work that are important, not whether you actually use the technology you said you were going to use. So, some surprises. Um, if there's no surprises, it's not science. We looked at test practices. So there's a bunch of test practices that we, we had hypotheses that these practices would predict high performance. Surprisingly, some of them didn't. So when QA primarily creates and maintains acceptance tests, that basically the, the stats told us that that, that question was not meaningful, that it gave us a no, basically, to that question. And when tests are primarily created and maintained by an outsourced party, which is a result that I'm going to talk a bit more about later on. Interestingly, we thought that developers creating on-demand test environments would be obvious. You know, clearly, that will predict high performance. That turned out not to be the case. 
Now, people then come up and ask me, well, why is that? We don't know. The data doesn't tell us why. So maybe people didn't understand the question in the same way. Maybe there just wasn't a correlation. We, we, we have no way of knowing. We just know that the, the data, the computer said no, basically, is what happened. So interesting and, in some cases, surprising. This year, we extended our model um, because there's, there's been, who, who here is a tester? OK, so some people think that testing, uh, that continuous delivery basically means no more testers, which is something that I really want to say is absolutely not true. Um, unfortunately, this uh, misconception has got around uh, in some parts of the community that CD means getting rid of the testers. That's categorically not the case. We still absolutely need to do testing, and in fact, testing becomes even more important when you're releasing more frequently. So we extended our model to look at continuous testing this year. What that means is, uh, and these are all validated, so these are all things that we found were valid and reliable and predicted uh, continuous delivery. Continuously reviewing and improving test suites to better find defects and keep complexity and cost under control. If you just keep adding to your test suites and you never look and find out which of those tests are actually ever failing or which of those tests are actually testing things that you can really do with your system right now, not something that you could do with your system five years ago. I mean, I've I, maybe this has happened to you. A test has failed. I've gone in to look at that test, and I've looked at it, and I've said, how could that test have ever passed in the last two years? Because it's testing a feature we built five years ago that doesn't exist anymore. And some very clever developer under time constraint has monkey patched that test to keep it working, even though what they should have done is deleted it. Because we don't delete tests, right? That's literally deleting quality from our systems. Never delete the tests. Um, so you've got to curate your test suites. And that's something that testers are really good at knowing how to do. And, and developers, um, and I am a developer, are really horrible at knowing how to do. Uh, so testers need to work alongside developers throughout the software development and delivery process. It's, testing should not be a phase after dev complete. Those manual test activities that are just as important in continuous delivery, exploratory testing, um, acceptance testing, which can include automated acceptance testing, those need to be performed throughout the delivery process. Uh, this is a controversial one. Who writes tests before they write the code that makes the test pass? Okay, it's the lost agile practice. It's a consistent, that's like less than a quarter of the audience. And that's consistently the case. So TDD, um, writing the test before you make, write the test pass, it works, it turns out. Who knew? Um, the important thing to bear in mind about TDD is that TDD is not, the point of TDD is not to create a test suite. The point of TDD is a design activity that helps you create testable code. Because you think as a consumer, as a customer of the code you're about to write. And so it helps you design an API that is easy to test. So trying to retrofit automated tests on a system that was not designed TDD is always more expensive, and those tests are more expensive to maintain because the system is not easy to test. If your tests are expensive and hard to maintain, that's telling you something about your system. It's telling you it's hard to test. And that's a real architectural characteristic that you should care about, especially if you want to test it more often because you want to move to more frequent releases. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, people say they're doing CI, um, but it takes half an hour for their build to run. It's 2018. Let's not do that anymore. Um, I want to talk about monitoring and observability. I only have a few minutes left. Um, so observability is one of these terms of art that has come into our domain in the last couple of years. Uh, this is how we define it. Um, monitoring basically is you have predefined metrics and logs, and you use that to understand your system. Observability is being able to heuristically and in an ad hoc way actively debug your system when you have problems using things that haven't been predefined. Um, so what we found, which was interesting, is that for the people who took the survey, they saw these as the same thing. So remember at the beginning how I told you that um, feedback on incidents divided into two things, um, notification from far away, notification from within the team? That didn't happen with our monitoring and observability questions. The data came back, and it, it didn't split into two things that mapped to monitoring and observability. And what that tells us is that the people taking the survey didn't perceive them as different things. Now, 
People who are experts will tell you they are different things, so that's interesting, right? What it tells us is that maybe people aren't at an advanced enough level to be able to distinguish between them, or maybe for the systems they're operating on, there's no difference in, in practice because they're not using those capabilities. So again, we don't know why, we just know that that's the case. However, using this stuff in general means you're 1.3 times more likely to be an elite performer. So I want to briefly cruise through some interesting management stuff. Everyone knows that managing work in process is important, right? Having WIP limits, not taking on more work before you finish the work you're doing, right? This is a, a well-known fact about um, management, right? So when we ran the data on this a couple of years ago, we found the correlation between managing work in process and software delivery performance is almost zero. So that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, what we found is this. It only works if you're also doing these other things. If you're also using visual displays to monitor quality, productivity, and work in process, so having displays with your build results and your uh, test status and uh, Kanban boards and so forth, um, and using data from your production environment to make business decisions. So if you do these three, three things together, then it's statistically significant. But just managing work in process without the visualization piece and without the feedback loops doesn't work, according to our data. We also looked at product management practices. So team experimentation. So who works on an agile team in this room? OK, who works on an agile team where if you come up with an idea for a new feature or for a change to an existing specification or story because the specification or story says something that you're like, well, this is clearly the wrong way to do it, uh, people will actually listen to you and you have a chance of changing the specificational requirements. OK, that's actually a pretty high number. Um, I have a lot of friends who say that that might not be the case in their organization and that if they try and come up with new stories uh, or if they try and challenge the existing stories that they get told off. Um, that's not agile. If the team doesn't have any input into the work they do or the way they do their work, then it's not an agile team, broadly speaking. There's a great blog post by Martin Fowler um, a transcript of a talk he did at Agile 2018 Australia, where he talks about this. Uh, working in small batches and then actually paying attention to customer feedback and implementing that, those all predict software delivery performance and they improve culture. Outsourcing has a negative impact. And when I say outsourcing, what I'm talking about is functional outsourcing. So when you outsource all of your testing or where you outsource everything or where you outsource infrastructure. So that kind of functional outsourcing Low-performing teams are 3.9 times more likely to use functional outsourcing. And what we think, again, the data doesn't tell us why. What we think is going on is basically when you outsource like that, you're forced to deliver work in really big batches, like releases or projects, and then hand the whole batch off to your testing outsourcing partner, and then hand that batch off to infrastructure and operations. So it prevents you working in small batches. That's what we think is going on. Again, a lot more stuff in the report. So I'm out of time. Just want to give you my conclusions. Number one, even if you think what you know is obvious, it's important to test with data. Those surprises that I showed you are great examples of what you find out when you do actual science. It tells you that you know, some of the things you thought are not actually true. Equally, if everything you think is wrong, that might point to some methodological problems. Like You shouldn't find that everything you thought is wrong. That, that's bad. Um, so but actually confirming these results, there's stuff that we, we have here, and you're like, well, yes, obviously, but actually showing that it's right using sciences is valid and, and useful. We've been taught to think we're dealing in a world of trade-offs. That's not always true, and particularly when, it, particularly when it comes to throughput and stability and availability, we can actually have it all. We can do better at all of those things. Software delivery is important, but you have to do it right. And finally, these culture and practices that I've talked about have a measurable impact. So again, please go and download the report. Um, love to get your feedback. If you want the report and a whole bunch more stuff, send an email to jezhumble at sendyourslides.com with the subject DevOps, and you'll get a bunch of free stuff. Again, subject DevOps, email jezhumble at sendyourslides.com. Thank you very much. Have a fabulous day.